to episode 8 of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida. I am your host, Josh Laborious, and this week we are talking about mental health. This topic is courtesy of Bonnie Lothar. Um, She's a member here at St. Paul, and what I would like to encourage you to do at this point is if there is a topic that we haven't talked about yet that you would like me to talk about, that you would like me to approach here on the show, I would encourage you very much, send me a message, send me an email, comment on whatever platform that you listen to to this on, because I, I love the suggestions and I love to talk about what you are actually dealing with, what questions you actually have. So, getting on to our topic for today... What am I talking about when I say mental health? This varies incredibly widely. We're talking things, I, I don't want to say as small, but as as manageable as maybe anxiety or depression to things as serious as psycho, psychopathy or um, other mental conditions that would result in you needing uh, very serious intensive care. So like... There's an incredibly wide spectrum, and there's also um, incredible variety even within each kind of spectrum. So within that spectrum, there's even greater variety there. And before we move forward, I w- want to put a couple things before you. First, I am not a mental health professional. I have very little training when it comes to diagnosing or dealing with or or um, helping with mental illness. I have a couple of counseling classes. That is about it. And I've read a few books because it is a topic that I care about. It's a topic that I have a lot of interest in, but I am not an expert on, especially the medical side, whether that be um, psychology or psychiatry or or full-time counseling. Um, I'm not an expert, and I want to put that out in front right to start with because I, I want to put us on the same page when it comes to why I'm doing this particular podcast, and that is I am not here to try and fix anybody to try and really give anyone uh, steps to take or a diagnosis of some sort or um, anything like that. So before we get started with what I have on mental illness and on where it intersects with our faith and what our faith has to say about it, I want to encourage you, if this is something you struggle with, see someone who is qualified. Go to a counselor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Go to a professional who does have the skills and the training to help you. So that is, that's what I want to start with. That's what I want to kind of lay down as the foundation for this podcast is I am not a professional, but I encourage you to seek a professional if that is something you struggle with. But I, I do want to talk about where mental health and mental illness intersects with the Christian faith. And this matters because there are a lot of people who struggle with this. As you listen to this, this might be something that you struggle with. This is something that I know a ton of people who this is a burden they have to bear. And I would be shocked if you, even if you personally, as you're listening to this, don't struggle with this, There is someone in your life who does. There are probably multiple people in your life who do, who struggle from depression or anxiety or um, obsessive compulsive disorder or bipolar or any of the, like, mental illness is so widespread. Everybody knows something who this is impacted by, so it's worth talking about. And it's something that in the past people have treated very poorly. There is this stigma, there is this um, mentality that mental illness is not genuine, maybe that people 
are just looking for an excuse for something or whatever the case may be. It's been handled poorly in the past. And some of that poor handling has been by people in the church. So as a church, as a faith, as people of the Christian faith, we owe it to say, yes, mistakes have been made in the past, apologize for that, and strive to do better. So it's worth talking about because we need to understand this a little more and understand what our faith has to say about it. So that's why it it does matter and it's sincerely worth talking about. So as we go forward, this is real mental health, real gospel. And as we always do, we're going to start in the Old Testament. We're going to look and see what scripture has to say about this. We're going to look at how that intersects with our faith and our lives. So Deuteronomy 28 Starting at verse 28 says, The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at the noonday as the blind grope in the darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways, and you shall only be oppressed and robbed continually, and there will be no one to help you. So context on this passage. I am not uh, I'm not cursing you. If you're listening to this and you were suddenly concerned that I had just cursed you, that's not what's going on. Um... These are curses for disobedience that God is speaking to his people. He's saying, obey me, or these are going to be the consequences of that. And this follows a series of curses about physical illness. So, what I want to draw from this is not that if you have mental illness, you are being punished by God. Hear me very clearly, that is not what I am communicating here. What I'm trying to communicate is that the the reality of physical illness and the reality of mental illness is very similar in that God kind of puts them both in the same category because if you look at this whole chapter, there's a list, there's a series of physical ailments and then right in the midst there's these, these mental illness, this, this madness, this blindness, this confusion of mind. And then it's followed by more physical, it's just part of these afflictions that man suffers from. That's a distinction that, or a lack of distinction actually, that I want to draw out because in today's day and age, for some reason we have completely distinguished and separated the physical and the spiritual, the physical and the mental. And I think the core of this is because we live in a society that loves the tangible, Loves things that we can prove experientially. Observational science. We love this stuff. And with physical illnesses, a lot of times you can point to something. You can say, oh, that person has a fever. The skin is discolored. There's something there that shouldn't be. Um, They're missing something. Like, for physical illness, there are things that we can point to that are tangible, that are observable to an outsider, to a third party, that we can say something is wrong. And for the spiritual, for the emotional, for the mental, there's not necessarily that. And yes, there may be instances where I guess the brain chemistry is off or something in the brain isn't formed as it should be. And that would be something that if you if you did brain scans, you could point and you could say, oh, that's wrong. But some things, you, you can't really do that. And for some things, we can't necessarily point to a reason something is happening. Which, in today's day and age, makes us want to dismiss it wholesale. But you see, God here in Deuteronomy uses both explicitly to punish. Mental illness is not a figment of the imagination. Mental illness is very real. Now, what I want to communicate to you is that we can't assume motivation. And what I mean by that is this. If someone suffers from mental illness... If you suffer from anxiety, from depression, we cannot say that God is punishing you. 
If you know someone in your life who suffers that way, I am not saying God is punishing them because we don't know what's going on. We don't know what, just like we can't explain why some people get cancer or Alzheimer's or dementia or arthritis or whatever the case may be. We can't explain why some people get sick in certain ways. Hypothetically, could it be God punishing someone? Yes, because God does punish. Could it be to drive someone into faith? Yes. Could it be a test? Yes. Could it be all sorts of other things? Yes. We can't assign motives. So it is not fair. It is never fair to say this person is suffering in this way because God is punishing them. And that's something I want to make very clear because I don't want any misunderstanding for why I am looking at this passage for Deuteronomy. What we can take away from this is that mental illness is not something new. People are not just making it up. But something I want to make very clear is we are not taking from this that if you are suffering in this way, you are cursed somehow. And that's what I want us to take out of Deuteronomy. So what does this look like in daily life? If you think you are suffering from a mental illness, depression, anxiety, bipolar, any and all Seek support. You are not necessarily just imagining things. And I say not necessarily, not to undercut anybody, but I'm sure, and, and I wouldn't know, but I'm sure that some people will occasionally go to a psychologist with concerns about a mental illness. They go through counseling or a battery of tests or whatever is done there. And the psychologist says, no, you're just having a rough time right now and you will bounce back. Or they they will point to... Um, to maybe a lack of illness. That is for a professional to decide. So what I'm saying is mental illness is not something to make up. If you think you need support, seek support. If you don't think you need support, but you see people in your life who do, be support. There's a great program that, that takes place all across the country called Mental Health First Aid Training. If you Google it, you can, you can find it on the internet. I would encourage you attend one of those trainings. Better yet, um, there is an organization, a Christian organization called the Christ Cares Clinic who facilitates trainings like this, but they have a unique uh, slant on it because they approach it from the gospel. They approach it from the faith, which as we get into, as we go forward, is invaluable to struggles like this. And what I want to take away most from this Deuteronomy passage is that we ought to be removing the stigma that mental illness is just somehow weakness or imagination or something like that. That's not, (laughs) that's not the case. So the real life is mental illness is something that people struggle with. It is a struggle that people face and it has been around for a long time. But the real gospel here is that God is putting and has been putting people in place to answer prayers. He has called people to the fields of psychology and psychiatry and counselors and all of these other mental health professionals He has brought them into those fields to build people up and support people who struggle in this way. And the other real gospel here is the gospel is perfectly poised to support people who are struggling in this way. And that drives us into our gospel lesson for today. Matthew 11, 25 through 30 says, At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So some textual notes um, that I want to start us off with is the first part of this passage talks about the hidden things of God. These are things about God that we don't know and that we cannot possibly know. Because God is God and we are not. So there are things he does, there are ways he does things that we cannot understand. So that's what this beginning is talking about. And it's lifting up children who are willing to accept that. Now, as we go forward, it talks about a yoke. For those of you who are unfamiliar, is a yoke is something you would use to control an animal, to burden an animal, to use an animal for labor. So... When he's talking about a yoke, he's talking about our labors, the things that are controlling us, that are burdening us. And he says, learn from me. So this entire passage is a exhortation to learn from Christ. So how does this reflect into our lives? I would say that this is true. This continues to be true, if not more so, for those who struggle with mental illness, because there, there is a struggle. There is a constant struggle. This is a burden that people might face. And Christ says, give me your burdens. But in the same way that giving Christ financial burdens might not alleviate them, giving him uh, stressors in your life with your work, with your, your physicality, with your health, they may not disappear That's not what's being talked about here. In the same way, if you take your mental illness to God and that burden to God, that doesn't mean it's going to disappear. But what happens is it does bring us a level of peace about it. And it's really hard to describe unless you have felt it. And I know that is not incredibly helpful, but how we get there is reminding ourselves in the midst of our burdens that Jesus Christ is taking care of us in our faith, in our walk with him. Because, you see, there is this this simplicity to the gospel. It is not going to make your life easier. It is not going to make you rich or powerful or wealthy. In fact, Christ promises the opposite of that frequently. But the simplicity of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins to bring us in to a right relationship with God. And I know sin is a theological word. It's a word that we kind of throw around and doesn't necessarily have a lot of meaning. For everything we do that we shouldn't do, that God has said, this is not my will. We are forgiven completely and totally of all of those sins which is accessible even to those who are struggling. If you are struggling with anxiety, you can understand your forgiveness. If you are depressed, if you are bipolar, if you are struggling from any mental illness, this is still a concept that applies to you. You are forgiven. Hear me again. You are forgiven. You are loved and valued. You see, and if we remind ourselves frequently enough, we will begin to actually understand and experience and feel that reality. I studied education in undergrad, and one of the things that was told to us is most of what people learn is caught, not taught. If you sit up at the front of the room and tell someone something... Some people will learn it and grasp it, and that's how they'll understand it. But for, the, for a lot of people, they catch it, they see it done, they do it, they experience it over and over again, and eventually they kind of they catch what they need. So if we put ourselves in this place where we're, we're reminding ourselves of God's love over and over again, and we're putting ourselves in his word, and we're reminding ourselves of his forgiveness repeatedly, We are going to catch that. We will begin to embody that and experience that. So in the midst of even our heaviest burdens of mental illness, we can come to God and say, I'm burdened in this way. Give me your peace. 
And that doesn't mean our burden's going to go away, but we have this peace in that we are forgiven and we are in a right relationship with God. And like I said, it's very hard to understand and explain, but there is truth to it nonetheless. And it's something I pray for each of you listening to this that you will experience. And what, what does it look like to come to God with our burdens? So let's get into that. First, this is faith. This is giving our burdens to God, saying, God, I'm burdened in this way. Please build me up with the trust that he's actually going to do it. Whether that means he's taking the burden away or making us stronger so we can deal with that burden, um, it, it comes down to our faith. What, what else does it look like to come to God? This does mean getting into his word. Read what the Bible says. We don't do that nearly enough. Come to worship. Be in community with other Christians. And the, the really cool thing, especially about that last part, about the community that Christ draws us into around himself, is that it brings an incredible level of support. I, I had a really close group of friends in undergrad. And um, most of us were Christian. And one of the ones who, who wasn't really solid in their faith, they were, it wasn't the only friend group they spent time with. But one, once upon a time, they approached me and they said, something is different about this group. Something is special. Something There's an authentic support and care and love for one another that isn't elsewhere. And I said, it's because our foundation is largely in Christ. We're a community who does seek to support each other because that's what we're called into. We can build one another up. So in some really real ways... Taking our burdens to Christ and being in Christ in that way can support us in the midst of mental illness. By putting us in community, by giving us people who support us and can build us up. As well as, and I can't stress this enough, is forgiveness. Because if you're carrying, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, if you're carrying around a burden of guilt from the things you've done, from the places you think or know you are not good enough, and someone brings genuine forgiveness to that, first of all, carrying that around is going to give you anxiety. It's going to create stressors that can make mental illness worse. So if you have that genuine forgiveness, that can be incredibly helpful in your journey and in your struggle. So in daily life, I would spend time in God's word. Allow it to influence and impact your life. Confess your sins and be forgiven. Admit whether it's to a pastor or to a friend or even if it's just between you and God. Say, I know I have messed up. I know I have fallen short. I have failed. Forgive me. And if hopefully if you take that to a pastor or a friend, they say, you are forgiven. And if you take that to God, I assure you, you are forgiven. As a servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that is enough. So the real life is we are tempted to fix things ourselves. We are tempted to to take our yoke, our burden upon ourselves and say, we are strong enough to make it. But the gospel is that God takes our burdens. He invites us to release them. And that the forgiveness is there when we fail. And what this does, this, especially this temptation to fix our things ourselves, it drives us into the epistle. And the epistle comes from Philippians 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So, the textual notes I have for this are, all this is driving at making it a habit of going before God, of praising God, of being in his word, of meditating on his love for us. And what this does is it refocuses our lives to him. And at this point, I want to remind you, I am not a doctor, a counselor, or a psychologist. I cannot make it all better. But what I can do is I can reassure you of the gospel and the goodness of God. And if we focus on that, that can be a great lift for our spirits. That can build us up. That can support us. But I think there's a danger with this. Because there are a lot of people that say, if you're struggling, you need to believe harder. Your faith isn't strong enough. You need to pray more, pray harder. That is not what I'm saying. And I've been reading an excellent book lately called Making Christian Counseling More Christ-Centered. And there's a technique that, that Dr. Mars describes in this book. He calls it the gospel empty chair technique. And he says, look at a chair that you're not currently sitting in. Look at a chair. Do you think it'll hold you up? And presumably the answer is yes. Do you think it can support you? Yes. Have the, have the person, have yourself, you go sit in that chair. The chair holds you up. Now, what was more important? Your belief that the chair would hold you up or the chair's strength to hold you up, the chair's capability to hold you up? Which was more important? And the reality of that is the chair's ability to hold you up is more important. And God is the same way. It's not our faith that God can support us that holds us up. It's God's ability to support us. It's God's real capability of building us up, of supporting us, of being there for us that matters. So what we have in conclusion for all of this is the real life is mental illness is hard. It's a process. It's something that we need support with. And we don't have all the answers. Like I said, I can't fix it for you. But the gospel message here is we have the answers that matter. We are forgiven. We are right with God. And no matter what our suffering is in this world, We have a promise of an eternity without suffering in heaven that we get to look forward to and that we get to focus on. And that is where our joy is. So to kind of summarize this whole podcast, to bring all of these issues, hopefully to a succinct head, if you are suffering or someone you know is suffering from mental illness, you're not making it up. It's a real, go seek help whether that be a counselor or a psychologist or a doctor, whatever the case may be, seek help because mental illness is not imagined. It's not made up. It is a real struggle. But the the joy we have as Christians is that God promises to come alongside us and support us in our struggles. And that doesn't mean he's going to take them away, but that does mean that we can focus on the peace and the hope that he gives us on the forgiveness and the love and the care that he has for you and for me. That's what we can focus on. That is where our joy is. Our joy is in the gospel. This has been episode eight of Real Life, Real Gospel. I'm your host, Josh Laborious. It is my pleasure to bring these to you every week. If you have a comment or if you have a topic suggestion that you would like me to tackle or respond to, please let me know. My email is 
vicar at stpaulboca.com. That's V-I-C-A-R at stpaulboca.com. You can reach out to me. I would love to have your suggestions as we go forward. Also, if you are enjoying this podcast, if this is something you want to hear more of, go ahead and subscribe, whether that's on Spotify, on YouTube, on Google Podcasts, on iTunes, or on Podbean. Subscribe, and then they'll let you know, first of all, when these podcasts are brought are published every Thursday. And also, we have some extra content that's going to be coming out soon. For example, uh, here at St. Paul, we have a worship arts leader, Keith LeCompte, who is at some point going to be doing a response to my podcast from last week on worship. So if you subscribe, you get notifications about stuff like that as well, which is exciting and it's stuff to look forward to. So give us a subscription. And if this is your first time, welcome. I would encourage you go back, see what else we've done, see what else is interesting to you. And hopefully this is all helpful for you in applying Christian faith to your real life. And with that, this has been Real Life, Real Gospel. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Serve the Lord.